big interest to all of you as you are thinking about uh, scaling and sustaining the education leadership work that you've been doing in your states and districts. We're hoping it's going to spark a lot of really good discussion. The way we've organized the webinar is that we have uh, three panelists uh, of great interest. As you can see on the as you can see on the agenda, and hopefully you've read their bios and you've read uh, some of their articles and chapters and pre-readings that were made available to you. Uh, Alan Grossman, Harvard Business School professor of management practice. Sue Bodilli, Director of RAND Education, and John Strand, Vice President and Director of the Academy of Educational Development Center for Social Marketing and Behavior Change. Each of our panelists is going to take approximately eight minutes or so to give you uh, his or her uh, main takeaways in regard to scale. And after we hear from them and see their PowerPoint presentations, uh, I will address some questions to the panel. And uh, they will, uh, not everybody will address every question, but they will weigh in. Uh, and then we will, uh, by that point, have assembled the questions that have come in from you. So again, please do keep those questions coming in. Right now, we're going to transfer uh, the presenter's role to our first panelist, Alan Grossman. Morning. Uh, I hope that uh, one can hear me. We can. Oh, terrific. Uh, this is the a little unusual to uh, be speaking to a detached audience, but I find the concept very exciting, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of the partnership uh, between all of you and the Wallace Foundation. Uh, I've been looking at uh, scaling in mission-driven organizations for some time and find it one of the toughest and most interesting challenges we all face. Uh, it's really a term that has been used in business for quite some time, and you notice that I uh, do teach at the business school. And the reason I bring that up is that it's quite well understood that in business and easy to measure that scale is just simply what is our increase in sales and profit. When we start to apply this concept uh, into nonprofits and into public sectors, we have a, a much more complex idea. And a good place to start, as far as, uh, as, as all of us, to get a collective agreement on what is the definition of scale. And perhaps the most significant difference from scale in a mission-driven organization and scale in a for-profit organization is the focus on impact. So if we have impact, then at the end of the day, um, it, it really doesn't matter how many people are using our practice or our program. Uh, what really matters is what difference it's making. And so when we think about this definition, we really must look at not just counting the number of people, but really observing how it has changed their behavior. And I, I look down at that, uh, at that last bullet, and I, I think about uh, converting what is common practice into best practice. And too often we focus on, on spreading best practices and then feeling confident that our job is done. In reality, there is not very much evidence that the simple transmission of a best practice will lead to behavioral change. And I, I give you the example that we're all living through now, General Motors has known how to manufacture cars from Toyota for decades, and yet at the end of the day, they simply didn't change their behavior and are paying the consequences. So for us, not just about the spread of, of, uh, of the concepts of what are best practices, but it's behavioral change. Now, why is it so difficult to actually achieve this? It's hard enough in any sector, and I would say that it's particularly hard 
when we look at the public education sector? Uh, well, one of the reasons, we don't have a lot of models. You know, we've really just started to think about it, dig into this, and it's very exciting that so many of you are focused on it and working with Wallace and us to try and really understand how do we do this in a way that effectively spreads the ideas and changes the behavior. One of those key aspects that makes it so hard, and I'm not going to go through all of, the, uh, of these forces, but when you think about it, Virtually all we do, we're subject to a multiplicity of forces that pull us in different directions. And I know you all uh, have experienced, if not all of these forces, at least some of them. And I also know how difficult it is for all of us to focus on a particular practice uh, or program in the face of so many distractions that we can't ignore. They are, are part of our reality. And finally, the culture that we've been living in for so long has really been one that has rewarded effort and output, and we're shifting. We're in a time of, of massive change looking at results. And if we don't get the results, then we really haven't achieved scale in the nonprofit sector and, and in the public education sector. And, and I, I tend to clump those two together very often uh, because at the end of the day, the, me the measures that we use are, are quite similar. Uh, when we go to achieve scale, what we have seen across most of the organizations that have been successful in achieving scale is that it's very, very important to set concrete goals and get the buy-in. Now, that seems rather obvious, and, uh, but nevertheless, as we traveled around to school districts, we found that goals were often set in terms of the number of people that they wanted to use the particular uh, practice, but there were very rarely a set of goals that reflected the kind of changes that they expected, and there was not a lot of thought of how to achieve uh, those changes. And uh, we all know of programs in public school uh, around the country that are now used by a lot of people, but not necessarily uh, impacting what's happening in the most important part of our discussion, which is in the classroom. And unless that happens again, we're just not achieving scale in terms of the, of the uh, public education sector. Uh, I want to focus also on that last bullet, ensuring organizational elements are in place, because once we understand what we need to get done in terms of achieving scale. We have to make sure that all of the elements are there. And I refer you, we, there is a note uh, on your resource page uh, uh, with a framework that may help you. You may find it useful in thinking about what kind of organization do we have to build or have in place in order to achieve successful scale. The other uh, part is that there are resources out there that can help us in our efforts. And I know many of you are working with government to change policy and regulations. But that's just the beginning. Uh, too often, we have seen that we can change a policy and a regulation and, again, not actually change the way we do things in the classrooms or in the schools. So I urge all of us to look beyond what does it take once we get the policy and regulations in place and consider them a foundation rather than uh, 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 some ultimate goal because they're just the beginning. And again, all of us know that there can be regulations in place that simply aren't impacting uh, the, the people out in the front lines who are getting the work done. The, the other parts as we think about scale is that we can't assume because people are saying they're doing it that they are actually changing their behavior. So observing and getting out there is, is a critical element uh, to our success. Finally, I just want to emphasize that we can't communicate these changes frequently enough, deeply enough, or broadly enough. This is a, a challenge that every organization faces it's a continuous process. It's a continuous process of learning. It's a, it's a two-way communication whereby we're not just telling people, but we're learning with them 
how scale is actually achieved and how they gain the most uh, from the programs and practices that we're trying to spread. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sue Bodilli. Uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you, Alan. Um, hello, this is Subo Dilly. And um, Alan, thank you for that great uh, uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to be following up with Alan, looking more specifically at some education work uh, that uh, uses some of the same concepts that Alan has already provided for us. Um, the basis of my comments are coming from several different studies that I've taken part in. One was the evaluation of the New American Schools uh, initiative back in the 90s, and uh, we followed that up with uh, a study of uh, 15 external reform providers and what they had, uh, the struggles that they had gone through and the thoughts they had about uh, what they learned in their scale-up efforts. And those included uh, uh, groups like America's Choice, High Schools That Work, uh, the National Writing Project, Project Grad, Talent and Development High School, um, as well as some related work on uh, collaborative efforts in citywide attempts to improve education. And this screen simply has some of the um, uh, links to the website where you can get free downloads. And so I encourage you to go to the charts afterwards and um, uh, look for these if I've piqued your interest. I want to reemphasize. Uh, uh, one of the key concepts that Alan has already introduced uh, in terms of the definition of scale. When we got these uh, 15 different external providers together, we thought we were going to have a real struggle in terms of if we could come up with a common definition of scale so that we could all talk about the same thing. But in point of fact, um, Professor Cynthia Coburn, uh, at the time from uh, University of Pittsburgh, had recently published an article uh, with these four ideas about scale, and everyone sort of immediately um, uh, uh, went to these and said, this is exactly right, and I want to emphasize the second one, the depth, so that the people who I have worked with, everything we've learned from looking at education uh, at scale, trying to bring classroom improvements, changes in practices, really focuses not just the no on the number of adopting units, but the depth of changes in practice that will eventually influence student learning. And then, of course, these big issues of sustainability and the shift in ownership. And I just want to emphasize that while people have studied and probably come up with some interesting lessons on spread, depth, and sustainability, in fact, we still struggle to understand how you transfer the knowledge to an adopting site so that uh, they feel comfortable from, from then on making it their own. Um, in the research that I've done, there seems to be some general agreement as, uh, uh, as to the process of scale-up. What, what are the characteristics of it? And Alan hinted at what used to be thought of as scale-up, which is a, a top-down mandate uh, told uh, schools what they were supposed to adopt and then measured implementation in terms of fidelity to some original concept. And if uh, uh, it wasn't implemented as originally planned, everyone blamed the teachers. Um, and what we've learned over the last decade or so is, in fact, if you really are going to scale up and get depth and sustainment, in fact, the process would look very different. It would be much more interactive. It would involve the school people, the district people, probably people from the state level. There would be adaptation uh, to the original idea over time, but through these reciprocal relationships uh, as people face unfolding situations. And one of the big situations we might talk about in the question and answer period is um, uh, the big uh, budget uh, issues that are facing states at this point in time. Um, but it's also important to understand that the people who have developed ideas um, no longer usually think of them as uh, you have to do it my way and it's all about fidelity. In fact, uh, what you see is a reiterative process of continuous reexamination and learning and improvement of the innovation over time um, as these different groups adopt it and begin to change their practice. And so the bottom line is this doesn't look at all linear. In fact, it could bump along up and down over a period of years. Um, 
in the work we've done, we uh, identified some common core tasks that the folks that we call the developers of the idea, which I think are many of the people who are on the line today, uh, undertook. And um, I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to point out uh, just a couple. One is that it is, in essence, your responsibility to provide or to figure out what the implementation supports are to, to move this idea forward and to help put them in place. And um, it's also your responsibility to try and figure out what high quality implementation might mean. Not the concept of fidelity, but the concept of depth. How are we really changing practices? What are the practices we want to see um, uh, develop over time? And how do we know if sites are really getting there? And what help we can do to ensure that uh, they do that? But then the third one is, is then follows from that. If, in fact, your idea, your wonderful idea, is not working as planned, then it might be time to actually change the intervention. And so it's very important to set up tracking and monitoring systems over time to help understand how this whole thing is unfolding. There's challenges involved in this, and I want to focus in on maybe the uh, just one or two of these. Uh, but in particular, creating economical supports. Um, by that, I mean uh, if you're expecting schools and districts to change their behavior, uh, the supports that you develop for implementation um, need to be ones that they can take on without causing significant dislocations in budgets. And so we can all imagine very wonderful, visionary ideas about how to improve education. But if we can't get it done within the um, realistic funding streams or realistic uh, intellectual capacities and resources of teachers and principals, then it's really not going to fly. And so a lot of thought has to be given to how to work with schools, with districts, to really get the supports into a format that is easily, or at least more easily, uh, implemented by them. Um, and then I just also want to uh, emphasize the fourth bullet, adapting funding over time as needs change. Um, when you think about scale up, uh, you know, you'll usually start small and then uh, increases exponentially over time. That means that the funding you have at the beginning might come from a few grants, but towards the end it's going to have to come from much more sustained and uh, permanent funding bases. And so there needs to be some thought in the process of uh, scale up as to what the funding looks like over time, how you expect it to change, and what the different sources of funding might be. I want to just leave with two, I thought, important ideas that came out of the panel discussions that we originally held back in January. Um, the first is that, and this is uh, Alan, I hope, can back me up uh, by saying that um, uh, in business, uh, oftentimes a new strategy for how a corporation is going to improve is not about adding something on. At least a significant part of it is getting rid of something that is not working, whether it's spinning off a uh, uh, part of the corporation or whether it's really changing practices that do not support the new um, strategy. So there has to be considerable thought given to terminating, uh, that's a tough term, but terminating what doesn't work. It's important. It enables slack in both resources such as funding, but also in terms of what I would just call the, the uh, human psyche. Uh, uh, those principles faced with multiple conflicting uh, priorities just cannot uh, keep going on that way. And so um, to get a new pathway, you have to tell them that some pathways are now blocked and they don't need to be attending to those um, uh, things anymore. Um, the other idea that came out is sort of, oh, you know, get me a great leader, get me a great principal, and we solve this whole, whole thing. But I think this whole effort that Wallace is uh, and the sites who are listening are uh, entertaining is all about understanding that that's not uh, sustainable, that won't work, and that we have to develop these leaders, which means that we have to expand the concept of leadership. In organizations undertaking scale up, it often involves um, significant team building. So instead of a principal, it's really about a principal and a group of lead teachers instead of a one district person in charge of this, it's uh, uh, sort of the cabinet of the superintendent really looking at this seriously and building a team that understands it. 
Um, and that then gets us back to developing these integrating relationships with others. Uh, Alan emphasized communicate, communicate, communicate. And all of my work says that that's important, this integrating relationships, building relationships with each other over time, and getting buy-in is important. I'm going to go ahead and um, change presenters to John at this point. Thank you so much, Sue. I mean, the, the ideas are, we're flying through them really quickly, and they're really powerful and important. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning, John. Um, I want to pick up from where uh, Alan and Sue uh, left off. And um, in particular, I want to um, cover this idea of promoting behavior change. Um, at, you heard uh, Alan focus on it related to improving best practice and converting best practice into common practice. Um, that's really the core of the work that I do, and it hasn't necessarily been connected to education. So. Um, I'm going to try in my brief time to give you a quick peek into the idea of thinking like a marketer, and I'm going to try not to lead you too far over to the dark side. <laughs> so um, Mike Rothschild, who's a professor of marketing at University of Wisconsin, uh, indicates that there are three large-scale approaches, well, three approaches to promoting large-scale behavior change. Each of these involves a, a trade-off or perhaps an inverse relationship between the uh, degree of choice and the degree of compliance. The uh, first uh, is education, and education offers the most choice and probably the least prospect for compliance. It works best with simple behaviors that, are, that offer clear benefits and have low perceived barriers. On the other end of the scale, we have regulation, which is, um, offers the least choice and probably the highest prospect for compliance. And regulation usually works best where the behavior is detrimental to the individual and society, where there's social consensus that supports regulation, and where the behavior is observable and susceptible to effective regulation. And then marketing prowls this middle ground um, and tends to work better where, they're, where the behaviors are complex or that they're hard to require or regulate, where benefits are less tangible and may be delayed, where there's quite a number of competing options for uh, uh, consumers, and where there are moderate to high perceived barriers. So, Social marketers use marketing principles to promote behaviors that really benefit the individual and society. And we recognize that consumers have choices, and they could refuse the behavior we're offering, so that we have to be able to compete effectively in order to be chosen. So we aim to offer our target consumers something they really care about in exchange for the behavior that we want them to do. And we use research to understand what we need to offer and how to deliver that. We usually start on addressing each new social issue with this question, you know, who must do what differently? And this question helps our clients and us, our team, focus early on some identified target audiences and some target behaviors that are related to the change that we're seeking to promote. Um, we are also, we, our social marketing approach is both a data-driven approach and it's theory-based. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, behavioral scientists um, in our organization, and so we draw heavily from social science and behavior theory to understand which determinants of behavior may be most associated with our in identified target audiences performing the desired behavior. And over the years, we found that these three behavioral determinants are, have been particularly robust across a variety of behaviors and audience that we've worked with. This first one, perceived consequences, refers to what I expect will happen if I perform the behavior. And as social marketers, not behavioral theorists, we are looking for mnemonics, so we just call this fun. And I don't want you to think about fun as ha-ha fun, but just think of it as you know, what would, will this behavior, will the consequences be rewarding if I perform this behavior? 
Secondly is this idea of self-efficacy, perceived self-efficacy, which just relates to my degree of confidence that I can actually do this behavior. I have the skills and resources needed to do it. And again, as marketers, we think of this as easy. Um, the third is this idea of perceived social norms. And that really refers to uh, what I think the kind of, what kind of support do I think I would get from people I um, respect and whose opinion matters to me if I perform this behavior. And again, as uh, marketers, we think of this as popular. So our broad rule of thumb is to think how to look for ways in which we can make our target behaviors more fun, easy, and popular from the perspective of our tar target audiences, not our own. And that's an important uh, distinction. So how do we go about making uh, behaviors more fun, easy, and popular? Well, social marketers are pragmatic, and we believe that most consumers consider choices that are in their own self-interest. So in order to make uh, behaviors more fun, easy, popular, we try to add benefits that are meaningful to our audience benefits that they care about this, what's in it for me is an important notion um, that we want to consider when we're um, positioning our offer. And secondly, we try to remove or lower barriers that they struggle with. Um, so there's this cost-benefit relationship that we try to understand for a given audience and a given behavior. Now, we always talk about competition in marketing, and in um, social marketing, it's no different. So we think about how do you consider social marketing in a case where you're trying to scale up uh, leadership reform efforts and best practices. And one of those is to think that your competition or any other choices that your consumers have, including the status quo. So your new and improved opportunities are head-to-head -head with the same old, same old, and you need to consider how is what you're offering as new and improved stacking up um, and competing in the minds of your audience. So to think about that, I would offer you this very simple uh, four by four, or excuse me, two by two table to think about choices that you have available to you from a strategic standpoint. And this is particularly important, I think, for those of you who actually um, have the have access to policy and regulation and laws um, that might uh, support some of these strategies. So the first one we've been talking about is you could try to increase the perceived benefits of the behavior you're offering. Um, and you know, one example of that from my field is how the anti-smoking uh, advocates repositioned the benefits of not smoking as offering teens an opportunity to rebel against big tobacco. So not smoking suddenly had an enormous a appeal that it never had before. The, alternatively, the competing behavior, you can reduce the benefits of that behavior. And again, taking that smoking example, the teens were able, uh, the anti-smoking advocates were able to make smoking appear as if you are being played for suckers by a manipulative tobacco industry. The, the other option is, of course, you can reduce the barriers to your target behavior, making it easier, less costly, more convenient. Um, and finally, you can make it more costly, more difficult, and um, less rewarding for the uh, competing behaviors. So, those are things that um, you will want to think about. They can be used in combination, but they're, um, uh, think, having an opportunity to think about them in these terms will really enhance um, some of the strategic planning that you would do. So with that, I'm going to send it back to uh, Jody and uh, let her take us into questions. Thank you so much. Uh, again, such rich material. What, what I'm going to try to do is uh, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to the panelists. And then, because we've gotten no questions uh, from you, uh, or some of them have just come in, what, what I think we're going to do is 
after I pose the two questions to the panelists, we are going to unmute you, and we will be able to take about three or four questions from the audience. If there are questions after that, then uh, we will give you a procedure by which you can submit questions after the webinar and, and get them answered. Uh, the questions that we did get were just around um, uh, will the PowerPoint be available and will the Q&A be available? Yes, they will. Uh, we will we will let you know after the webinar where you can uh, where you can go where we will have them archived. So let me just so with the heads up to everybody that uh, we will you will have an opportunity to ask your own questions uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, let me just pose a couple of questions to the panel. The question number one is, and, and, and Sue brought this up especially, but I think it's near and dear to all our hearts, uh, the, the question about removing old practices in order to make room for new ones. Uh, do any of the panel members have, uh, that's a critical thing to do, and you know, maybe among the hardest things to do. Do any of our panelists have some specific advice uh, to our webinar participants about good practice when it comes to planning to remove old practices to make room for new ones? I, I can, uh, this is Alan. Uh, what we have found the most effective is in, as a way to eliminate programs that are often the darling of some constituent uh, within an organization, a school district, is to ensure first that the strategy for what you're doing is very clearly articulated and spread and agreed upon by all the participants in the organization. When that happens, and it's clear that the strategy is focused around achieving the mission and doing better work and towards performance, when that happens, it's much more difficult to continue to defend a program that is a favorite or a darling, but not necessarily effective nor in, uh, aligned with the strategy. Okay. Um, this is Sue. Uh, I'll just add a few concrete examples, but also sort of get to this uh, 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 cloud uh, uh, hanging over our shoulders, which is uh, potential funding cuts uh, uh, in the coming years. Um, I think that in terminating, you need to be strategic, but you also need to be opportunistic. So at this point in time, some of the states are saying, you know, they're going to be cutting back on different uh, programs. Well, that may mean to you that now's the time to advocate for getting rid of all the professional development uh, uh, programs that you know have not been doing your principals or your lead teachers any good, um, and then uh, uh, offering up uh, that something else be put in its place that you think will be much more effective and hopefully even much more cost effective. So, I mean, that's just one strategy, but I'm focusing in on professional development because there's all sorts of dollars uh, within budgets hidden often uh, uh, where we're spending on money on professional development that's really not doing us any good. It's a perennial uh, complaint of teachers and principals. And yet, as part of this strategy, you need to say, OK, can we get rid of some of that if we have a clear indication of what we would put in its place? And is now the time to advocate for that type of change? Can we take advantage of the opportunity offered in a, uh, a, a difficult budget situation? Jody, I don't have anything to add to that. All right, well, thank you. Um, one, of the, one of the tensions, it seems to me, in, in scaling is on one hand being faithful to the effective program or the, the, the effective model that has brought you to want to scale it, uh, but on the other hand making adaptations so that uh, local context is, is taken into account and the program is relevant locally. Uh, does, does anyone care to comment on on that tension between fidelity to the original program and local context and what some of the difficulties or challenges are in, in maintaining that balance. 
Um, I can comment on it, and I, I take it back to something this is too, that Alan said. Um, he said when he, he understands scale in nonprofits, it really has to do with impact. Um, fidelity to the model um, implies that we hope that the model has been tested and that it, in fact, can have that impact. But we often ask the question, under what conditions? And so for anyone who's developing a model or a program or an idea, um, you really want to ask yourself, under what conditions is it effective? And what adaptations need to be made for certain common conditions? Um, so for example, a, a school system that has a heavy, high, uh, a high percent of um, poverty, uh, children in poverty, uh, with, say, significant demands for English as a second language, facing um, a big budget cut. That's one condition you might uh, try and think about. How does your intervention work there versus a suburban school system that uh, is facing much fewer challenges and that tends to lure some of the most uh, uh, productive principals and teachers. Um, so the, I'll call the folks on the line the developers they can actually think up the three or four different uh, situations that they are likely to face in their states and come up with adaptations appropriate for those and actually work with some of the schools and districts in those conditions to develop those. That way, you don't have to have a position of, well, anything goes, but you can have a much more thoughtful position of, here's the main conditions that impinge upon the implementation of our idea, and then here's version A of the idea for condition A and version B for condition B. Let me just uh, add to what Sue was saying. What we have discovered is that when you get people in a room, I was just uh, recently in a school district and there were 20 principals in a room talking about a reading program. Uh, in the abstract, we tend, it seems, to exaggerate the differences across all of the schools and not focus as much as we should on what are the core elements. Now these core elements have to be tested. We can't just decide what they are. But in the face of experimentation and practice, I believe in every program there are some core elements that should basically stay the same across environments. And it's important to know those core elements so you do have some consistency of practice and some way uh, of sharing uh, information. And when we know the core elements, again, we, uh, I encourage uh, what Sue was and understand how and what must be adapted uh, across uh, various environments. But too often we focus on adaptation and not enough on what are those non-negotiables that are the elements that make this program uh, as rich and as powerful as we hope it can be. And I would just echo what uh, Alan and Sue just said. When, it, when we've been working with uh, usually community organizations to adapt best practices, we are always looking towards um, identifying those core elements that um, Alan and Sue mentioned, um, and usually uh, working with the developers of the program to identify those or the evaluators of the program. And then we, we, we try to address um, communities desire to feel that they are special and different while still suggesting that um, not every bit of the program needs to be adapted you know for Nashville's needs versus Memphis's needs for example and um, it's a it's a process but the the focus on the core element piece is um, really essential from our experience um, well, that's, that's terrific. Let's let's do this. Let's we are we're going to uh, take off the mute button and see if uh, some. We probably have time for two or three questions uh, from our participants. Uh, we have uh, some of our Wallace folks who have questions. Uh, if you don't, so but let's let's unmute you and give you an opportunity to uh, to raise your voice.
In the meantime, Richard, why don't you ask your question so that we don't... Sure. Okay. So I wanted to connect uh, this Richard Lane of Wallace. Um, I wanted to connect something that Alan talked about with um, the chart that John ended with. So, Alan, you, you talked about the powerful forces discouraging sustained focus, right? So the multiple stakeholders, the politics, um, the, the transition in the system, which, which to some extent means that there are a lot of different actors, uh, target audiences that need to be involved in a change process. So connecting that with a two-by-two two matrix John provided, it starts to get a lot more complex when there's competing interests of powerful players in, in the work we do. And I'm interested in, you know, either how you bring those competing interests more in line, how you balance um, benefits for one, decreasing barriers for another. But if, if either you or all three of you have comments on that, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on it. Well, I, you're absolutely right. And I, uh, in terms of the difficulty, and I say to my colleagues here, and I think you've heard me say this, Richard, that uh, these school districts, in terms of leadership and management challenges, uh, are difficult as any management challenge in America today. I think it makes running a business look rather simple, actually, uh, because they don't have these competing agendas. But the first thing, and what we've observed in school districts that seem to be making real progress, is that there is a carefully and well-articulated set of goals. So in Montgomery County, for example, uh, there's an established goal that in their, in their school system that 80% of the students will be college ready by the year 2014. Now, they did a lot of work to get that established and people to buy into that goal. Now, once they got the goal established, they kind of backward mapped as to what strategy to achieve that. And they, <clears throat> by bringing in all the constituencies, they would um, have opinions about what might work or what might work. They were listened to. But at the end of the day, the strategy uh, as to having certain amount of content and knowledge be learned every year that relates to the following year and the previous year in order to achieve that objective was rather irrefutable. And they started to get and are getting still obviously pressures, but they tend to be more on the margins and tend to be more difficult to argue when there's agreed upon goal and an agreed upon strategy. And I think one of the things that we haven't done well in talking to dozens and dozens of superintendents is actually communicate confidence what these goals are and what our strategies are as opposed to trying to accommodate each one of these very different forces, which at the end of the day I don't think will get us to where we want to get to. Okay, well, slight change in plans. Uh, we learned more about the technology and uh, uh, that will prevent us from unmuting you. So for those of you who are looking forward to being unmuted, uh, wait till next time. In the meantime, we have had questions come in um, on, uh, on in the question box, and Aola is going to uh, be the voice of those questions. We'll take those two questions, and then we'll ask each of the panel members for a brief uh, their 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 uh, final summation. Aola, please. Uh, one question came in from Mike Johannick from the University of Pennsylvania uh, asking what are the differences between scaling practice versus scaling program and policy, particularly in light of the findings about less emphasis on fidelity to a top-down or unified model uh, and the uh, comments on behavioral change. Well, I think that, uh, I don't mean to uh, jump in again, but I think I use those terms only because uh, we have fuzzy definitions at this point, and I wanted to make sure that I was inclusive here. Um, at the end of the day, it's the practice and it's the behavior that, chain, that, that we need to change that has to be scaled. Uh, and programs or policy are part of the building blocks of how we go about getting the practice change, but I think that's a very good observation uh, that maybe we should just uh, refer to it as the change in practice. 
Yeah, this is Sue. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, oftentimes we talk about uh, the adoption of particular programs or uh, different policies. That's the infrastructure that helps support best practice. And again, if you go back to the definitions that of scale that are now more you know commonly being used, the focus is very much on changing the practice to improve uh, uh, student learning over time. And so we always have to get back to the practices of teachers and students in classrooms. Well, terrific. And so perhaps one final question and then a final word from each of our panelists. All right, our final question comes from Cheryl King, indicators uh, from EDC. Uh, indicators of impact are often less transparent, particularly when attributing changes in leader behavior to student achievement. Can you talk about what you believe to be essential steps in this process? I, I, this is Sue. I couldn't quite hear the question. I'm sorry. Could you, yeah, could you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, the question comes from Cheryl King from EDC. Indicators of impact are often less transparent, particularly when attributing changes in leader behavior to student achievement. Can you talk about what you believe to be essential steps in developing these indicators of impact? Um, uh, this is Sue. I actually, th this is a great question, and I actually think this is one of the things that the people on the phone need to address. I'm not uh, escaping responsibility here, but in talking about how to develop better leaders and creating policies and infrastructures and support, part of that process has to be what they think that means. Now, there's significant literature out there on what a good a leader is in a school or in a district, etc. Um, but Cheryl's right in, in sort of hinting at the difficulties involved in uh, drawing cause and effect relationships because of the um, uh, very complex situations under which uh, this is all functioning. But there's opportunities even within this group to be trying different things and to learning across sites to help push that whole field forward. Um, and so I think it's one of the things that need to be discussed within this group as a way of creating the policies that they would want to put in place. Uh, the, the other thing I would just add is that uh, we try to jump too rapidly to what are our impact measures and, and think that that's a sort of a destination as opposed to a process. Uh, when you start to think about impact, I find that the most powerful thinking comes from the people actually doing the work. And when you can get them together and start saying, you begin a process of how do we know it's being, it's effective? What are some of the indicators? They usually have a pretty good sense. And that's part of the system that you want to make sure is in place, that that then doesn't become frozen, and that you have the ability to revisit this, whether it's every six months or every year or every three months, to go back and keep iterating what these impact measures look like and how do we continuously improve them based on, on what we're learning. But it's truly at the frontier of where we are in terms of knowledge. Um, this is Sue. Can I add something to that? Um, Go right ahead. Uh, one of the key questions in uh, any uh, uh, look at leadership is sort of who's, who's following. And so we're using this term leader, but we haven't talked about the followers. Um, Instead of going right to the final impact, which I think is important to do eventually, the interim measure is really how it is, what, what leaders are doing to affect the efficacy of teachers. And um, there have been uh, different uh, surveys developed and uh, indicators developed uh, where you ask the followers, the teachers, um, how the principal's behaviors and management style, et cetera, are affecting them and their teaching in the classroom. And um, those exist out there uh, in the literature uh, that could be accessed right now. Well, terrific. Uh, just before I turn this back to our three panelists for some concluding comments, I uh, want to answer a question that has come uh, in the question box about the availability of additional resources, uh, which is a great question because the purpose of this webinar was to, in fact, start everybody, uh, add to everybody's thinking uh, and spark some new questions. Uh, there will be new resources available. And again, 
uh, if everybody on this call gives feedback to the person who invited you, uh, the feedback will be taken very seriously in the development of additional programs and resources. So we are looking forward to hearing uh, what additional resources might be useful. We uh, would plan to have more of these webinars. Uh, we are planning to have moderated online discussions with a broader audience around uh, topics related to scale and sustainability. We have a number of really good readings and resources, so uh, it's, it's all in the service of uh, the larger learning community, and we really need to hear from you about what, uh, what resources you're interested in. So please do give feedback to the person who invited you, and uh, those people will give the feedback uh, to Wallace. And so um, for our three panelists, concluding comments, please. Why don't we go in the same order that we've been? Alan? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just point out how little we truly, including myself, know about scaling mission-driven organizations. We're, the, the dialogue only really uh, began a couple of years ago where we were unpacking it to understand the differences. And I would urge you to become, I, I just am really uh, attached to this notion of a learning community because y your experiences will inform the ability to collect these experiences and make sense of them so that we can actually help develop the best practices is, is really important. So um, do not, when you're faced with the frustrations, uh, consider yourselves as not being successful. You're the pioneers out there. <laughs> I would, I would finally point to the fact that one of the good places that we all need to start work on is this shift in culture. Because when we can get all of the people within our organizations to agree that they're part of a learning community, that it's safe to actually make some mistakes, that they can actually move forward on this scale, then we have some of the first indications of success as opposed to a, a kind of environment where they think they're, um, they're being measured, monitored, uh, and cannot experiment. Congratulations to you all. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alan. We're yeah, thank you, Alan. It's an image in my head. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one I would echo. Um, uh, you all are pioneers. Um, I think and as pioneers, you know, as they, uh, the ones in the United States headed off uh, to the West, they saw opportunity. Uh, there was danger, but also opportunity. And I can't imagine a more exciting time uh, in education than what's going on right now. Um, one that makes clear the importance of having strong leadership at the school and district level, um, and one that offers incredible opportunities to figure out how to make that happen. We have um, uh, charter schools. We have teacher incentives. We have uh, uh, accountability being put in place. We have early childhood programs being put in place, uh, after school programming. Um, all sorts of things uh, being put in place slowly but surely that help meet children's needs in a much more constructive way if the leaders can step forward and help make it a cohesive whole. And so opportunity abounds here to really make a difference and to really learn. And so while Alan has said what a difficult task it is, I agree it's a very difficult one because of the multiple stakeholders involved and everyone sort of protecting their own interests. But what a time to really step forward and see if we can uh, uh, understand in much more detail what really makes a difference in terms of leadership. And I would just uh, close by saying that, you know, from a, uh, you know, how to scale this up and address uh, issues of behavior change, uh, keep in mind that question of uh, who needs to do what differently. Um, and then uh, marketing and uh, starts with listening. And so as you identify those different stakeholders, um, talk to them or try your best to learn what it is that is, needs to happen for, for this behavior change and the new practices that you're uh, advocating to uh, effectively compete with the status quo and with other options and how you might 
uh, help make those uh, new behaviors and practices more fun, easy, and popular. Thanks a lot, and good luck, everyone. Thank you, and, and join the Wallace folks in a round of applause wherever you may be. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.